Hey guys and welcome to another Amadeo Compositions tutorial. Now this is the uh, 15th tutorial in the first steps in preparation series and um, today we're going to take a look at the camera properties. Okay, so I noticed that um, for the next few tabs we are going to need the compositor um, so I can show you all the things and in order to use the compositor we also need to know um, about the camera settings. Okay. So if you select your camera, you can then see that um, this context sensitive menu changes and you can here see uh, this camera icon. And if you click that, you are in the camera properties. And here you can make a few adjustments uh, as to, um, yeah, about your camera. So let's get started. Let's just minimize all the tabs except for the first. And now with, um, uh, by the way, for those who don't know anymore, with zero on your numpad, you can go into camera view. And if you're looking at your scene from any angle, just press Control Alt Zero uh, to reposition your camera. And also, um, if in the properties panel you select lock to camera, lock, lock camera to view, then you can now freely move as if you were uh, navigating around the viewport normally, and your camera follows along. Um, yeah. So, yeah, let's get started with the um, camera properties. Now, first thing you can change is between perspective and orthographic, okay? And you can see it's quite a drastic change here. Um, perspective is a view where, where um, your the depth of your scene is not being considered, okay? So, as you might know, um, things that are further away from your camera, let's just do that real quick, further away appear smaller, okay? So um, our brain is quite clever, so our brain can, can tell us that those objects are probably the same size, but are, when actually comparing the, the real size, you can see that this one's much smaller because it's further away from the camera, and that is perspective view. And um, by the way, you can also select your camera by right-clicking on this border here. And then you can see focal length, okay? And um, that value is basically lens specific. Now in Blender, we don't really have a lens, but we can just simulate lens luckily. So if you increase that, you can see it gets closer and closer. And then in order to get the same view, you have to zoom out. And now that was a bit too close, but let's go with 150 for now. And if, you, if you zoom out, you can see it becomes flatter and flatter and more and more similar to orthographic, okay? And the lower that value, uh, the stronger is the distortion. So if you go to, let's say, 15, and you have to zoom in, you can see the size difference between foreground and background is much, much bigger. So usually 35 is just fine for most, most, most scenes, but sometimes, for example, if you want to photograph or if you make a render of a character from close up, then you want to set that to something higher because otherwise um, the whole face kind of looks distorted and unnatural. And you can also just um, change the focal length in millimeters or in degrees. Okay, so as you can see here, 35 millimeters corresponds with 49 degrees. The higher that value, um, the lower the focal length in millimeters. can see it's not quite uh, doesn't quite work that well with with the with the corresponding numbers unfortunately yeah now what you can also you can also check panorama and what that does it kind of gives you a fish eye effect apparently I've never really used that but right now if you render this scene you can see that's how it looks and let's just do a few things here let's just um, change that lamp to be a hemi lamp <coughs> and let's just Go to top view and let's just add a few more cubes so we can compare it better to scene. Okay, now if we have 12, you can see that's what it looks like. And if we uncheck, if we uncheck panorama, it looks like this. You cannot really make out a difference right now, in my opinion. Or you can, but it doesn't really 
uh, yeah, tell much. It just kind of uh, distorts everything. And um, if you have like a very extreme uh, focal length here, let's say five, then I believe it becomes more apparent. Let me just see. Looks this way, and with panorama, it looks this way. I, now you can actually see the distortion quite well. Um, yeah, as I said, I, I, I barely ever use that, but maybe you have some kind of use for it. Um, anyway, let's put that back to a natural number of, let's say, 35. And that's what we get. Oh, by the way, zooming in and out is just G to move your camera and then pressing your middle mouse wheel to get into a zoom mode. Um, okay, now one other thing you might notice, if you go to orthographic, you can see um, it, in this case, it, it got closer to it, okay? And if you change the focal length, let's say 100, and then you go to orthographic, we still have the same view as before, so the focal length does in no way affect um, what is within camera view or within the uh, rendered area in orthographic. Therefore, we have orthographic scale. Then you can just scale everything up and down. And of course, also in orthographic, panorama is not checkable, which would make no sense otherwise. So let's put that back to, to like, I don't know, 10. Oh, and also in uh, orthographic, unfortunately, even if you hit G and then middle mouse wheel, you cannot zoom in any way, okay? You just get... Yeah, you, you, or that's not quite true. You, you do zoom, you do um, move your camera, but it doesn't really change what is rendered because, uh, yeah, there's no focal length, no lens. So um, if you go too far back, then at one point you just cannot see your scene anymore because um, it is outside your limits, but more about limits in a few seconds or minutes. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go back to, back to perspective. And let's put it back to 35, not 3. Okay, now the next thing is something I don't, I've never really used before, I don't even know what it's good for, but it's called shift. And you can shift your camera in the X and Y direction, okay? And, um, yeah, let's put this back to zero for now, and let's go to zero on your, numpa on your numpad. And now if we change one of them, you can see your camera kind of shifts. Now, maybe you can animate that to get um, a cool effect, but other than that, if you put that to some, something extreme to, this, to just show off the um, effect, then you can see it's it now phases into a wrong direction, so you now you have to turn it. And now you can see um, everything is weirdly distorted and looks, 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 looks weird. It's kind of a cool effect in a way, but I, I'm not quite sure what you can use that for. Same goes for the Y distortion, of course. Yeah, now we don't know where we are anymore. Um, let me just see. And yeah, now it looks like this. So, um, very weird effect. Um, yeah, it just distorts everything in the Y and the X axis. I've never used that before. Chances are you won't either because uh, it's very weird. Anyway, next thing is quite important is clipping. So let's just uh, make sure we face our scene at a useful angle here. Let me just see. I'm, I'm a bit too far away, ain't I? Here we go. Sometimes navigating is not quite uh, that simple. Okay, now the clipping. Um, with those values, you can actually set what is being rendered and what isn't. What is within uh, the uh, the range that is being rendered and what isn't. So right now we have 0 0.1 to 100. And um, in order to display that, let's just jump ahead to display and let's select limits. And now you can see we've got this orange line and everything within this orange line is being rendered. And that orange line starts at 0.1, which is this value, and it ends at 100, which is this value over here. Okay, so um, 
if for example you want to see through the first few cubes just increase the start value and they will disappear as you can see at some point or just take the end back and then you can see they will disappear as well so if we set this to something like that if you have 12 you can see that's what you get because the rest is not being considered um, yeah can be useful for some things for example if you want to I don't know if you want to make your own sitcom and you need to be able to watch into a room or something um, yeah <laughs> uh, let's put that back to 100 and that back to 0.1 Now I'm not sure why um, you're not supposed to put it to zero because oh wrong <laughs> wrong way around 100 and zero you cannot even set it to zero by default it's at point 0.1 um, usually I just uh, leave it at that because it doesn't really matter I'm sure it wouldn't hurt to put that to point zero zero one. let me just see Yeah, it doesn't really make a difference at all. Okay. Um, cool. Now let's just leave it at that for now. And let's minimize the lens and let's go to camera. Now here you can make a few settings um, for your camera. Very important if you want to match footage um, that you actually recorded in real life. So you can actually choose a camera. Uh, Canon or Nikon, whatever you have. A red one, I'd love. I'd love to have a red Epic, but... Uh, yeah, quite quite expensive, and um, depending on that, it actually chooses the sensor width, the sensor height, and the sensor fit. Now I'm not quite uh, so well informed on those settings. What I do now is um, every camera has a sensor, and there are different sensor sizes. And if the sensor is bigger, it is less cropped. Um, then you ha have a few advantages, like um, uh, with the uh, same lens you can record a wider area and it's better in low light situations um, but yeah I don't really know what the difference is in sensor fit and what is quite interesting is if we go back to blender which is basically the same as um, a default then you can see we've got a size of 32 and you have auto over here and now if you increase the sensor size even though um, the uh, focal length stays the same um, your perspective changes okay so the bigger the size the more can you can record and the less the size the less you can record uh, yeah quite a similar effect to the focal length now if you um, change that to an other camera let's say you have a Canon 5D which would also be quite cool to have and now if you can see the center of it is horizontal okay so now the width changes everything but the height doesn't at all. You can change the height however you want. And the other way around, if you would have a camera or something that has a vertical sensor fit, then um, the vertical and the height changes everything and the width doesn't do anything at all. Okay, so I think uh, it's supposed, I'm not sure why it does that. I hope it's supposed to do that. But uh, yeah, that's how it works. Now, depth of field. Um, this is something that we should probably cover, let's just set that back to Blender default when covering the compositor, which will be quite soon as I said before um, but we can still take a look at that now depth of field is basically, for those who don't know, just um, what is in focus and what isn't, okay? so that is essentially dependent on your um, camera settings, okay? and then your on your focal length and your center and so on however, in Blender that's not the case, it lost, at least not in Blender internal so you have to, you can just do that afterwards in the compositor and there you can do it freely and you can just enter any values you want so it's not necessarily physically accurate but it works just fine and gives you a great effect so what you can do here, you can decide um, what point in your scene is your fo focus point, okay? so you can either choose, choose um, an object, for example cube 2 and now you can see this is probably cube 2 no, this is cube 2, no, this is Um, give me just a second here. 
uh, yeah, cube 003, I mean. And then you can see cube 003 is over there or over there. Yeah, it's over there. And you can see the origin of the cube is actually where this marker is. And that just means that everything in this plane is in focus. Everything after that is out of focus and everything before that as well. And depending on your settings in the compositor, that is more or less strong. That um, doth effect. Now, let's just talk at camera again. Now, what you can also do, you can delete that, enter, and now you can um, change the distance manually, okay? And now the problem is, even if you want to have to focus on cube 003, which is this one over here, you can, you can only focus the origin if you're using um, the cube, okay? However, if you go with distance, you can just, um, where, here we go, you can just adjust it however you want. And you can also animate it, for example, if you want to... That's a very cool effect, if you want to um, present just a certain object, then you can kind of, with the camera, slide along one of the edges, and then you can just animate the depth of field, and it gives that very, very uh, mystic, uh, mystical behavior. It looks quite cool. Um, anyway, that's depth of field for you. So, next thing is display. And that is also quite cool. So right now we've already talked about limits, which is, uh, which just shows what is within the camera range and what, and where is the um, um, the DAF marker. Okay, so where is your focus point? Now, let's just disable that and let's take a look at the next thing. And um, I'm sorry about the last tutorial when we covered mist. Um, we could have simply checked mist here instead of the limits and the depth of field value which I didn't think about that, so sorry about that, but anyway, I can show you now. Um, when creating mist, you have all the settings that I we talked about in the last tutorial, and then you have like this um, start and depth, okay, that's the same thing as we have here. That's where your mist effect starts. Then that is the range over which it um, increases until it reaches full um, intensity, and yeah, that's just the line here. Also quite useful. Um, and then those other three are actually in camera view, so let's hit zero on your or on our numpad, and now you can see title save, and you can see um, this dotted line here, and this is just the area in which um, you should position your titles if you are making footage for very 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 old TVs, so very old cathode ray TVs especially. Um, you know, they kind of cropped the image, because if you remember, they had like slightly rounded corners and slightly you know, just distorted images. And there it was important that you um, put your tiles and your text into an area that is that can surely be displayed on those displays. Now, nowadays, that is not a problem at all anymore, because as you might know, today's um, flat screens, they have like perfect quality anyway, so everything is displayed. But uh, yeah, just so you know that it exists. The next thing is sensor, okay, and as you might remember, uh, under camera, we were able to change the sensor size. Now, if we have it on auto, it doesn't really do anything, let's put it at 32, but if you go, for example, to a Canon 1D, whatever, you can see the ratio isn't 1 to 1. Now, if you change the width, then that's what happens, and if you change the height, nothing happens, but, uh, well, I mean, it does change the how the sensor is displayed but it doesn't really change anything about your scene i'm not really sure what that is good for this the fact that this is displayed now but i'm sure there's some kind of reason for that um yeah so let's go back to blender and now let's just uncheck sensor let's go to name and that's quite simple it just displays the name of your camera because as i showed you before you can have uh, several cameras and this way you at least know what camera you're using right now Okay, and uh, ideally, or usually, this name corresponds with what you have over here. Because if you duplicate this camera, and you go to zero, you can see it's once again the one displayed here. And if you change it to zero, zero, one, you can see the camera changes automatically over here as well. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> 
let's just uncheck that one as well. And now come a few very cool settings, and that is those guides, composition guides, okay? So I'm not sure how familiar you are with those, but especially when creating art, you're, sup you're not supposed to, but it is a good idea to um, composite or to arrange your image according to some rules. Now, let's just check them one by one. First thing is center. Quite simple. Um, oh, let me just do something else so it is easier to see those lines. Under themes, under user interface. Um, give me just a second here, I'll just pause the recording. Um, okay, I just changed the background to uh, something, some ugly yellow, just so you can see the lines better. Okay, now if you're in camera view, you can see that you have like markers that um, split your camera view in two, and that way you can actually arrange your images accordingly if you want to focus on something in the center. However, you shouldn't do that when making artwork or something, so you should rather go with, for example, let's see, um, with the rule of thirds, okay? So let's now uncheck center, and you can see this is a third this is one third from the other side and the same goes for over here and now you can actually arrange your image according to the rule of thirds or maybe you also need, you need center diagonal for something or golden um, let me, okay now what golden means is quite uh, quite tricky but um, it's called I think in English it is the golden ratio now what it means is just that if you divide that length by um, this length, you get the same value as if you would divide this length by this length, okay? Or also, I guess, if you divide the whole length by this length, it's the same as dividing this length by this one. And the same goes for over here. It's kind of similar to the rule of thirds, but uh, if you browse through the internet, you can see that ideally you shouldn't really use the rule of thirds, but you should r use this golden ratio. And, uh, yeah. And then there's also a golden triangle. You can see like this, and there's the golden triangle B, which is a bit, it's just the other way around. And then there's like um, a harmonious triangle. And they're all a bit different. I'm not sure what, what they are supposed to be used for all of them. I usually go with a golden, tri a golden, golden ratio, and sometimes golden triangle if you have like a weird perspective. I'm not sure if, I'm, if I use them right, but uh, yeah can be handy sometimes. Um, okay, now the other thing is the size. This is the apparent size of the camera up to in the 3D view. It doesn't change anything, okay? So your scene looks the exact same thing, the render is the exact same, but sometimes if you have a very big scene, you're probably um, happy if your camera is a bit bigger, so you can actually see it well. And I just noticed that the background color is not ideal at all, so let's just change that real quick here um, to something better. Let me talk about better. Okay, that's that that should work. Um cool. Point five is default. And now this passepartout, or whatever that's called in English, passepartout or something. Seems to be French, so it's probably passepartout. And now this is just this darkening effect, okay? So because if you have just the zero uh wrong one. If you uncheck it, I mean, you can see it looks very similar to your n normal viewing mode. And the problem here is that if you have like a lock camera to view, then it can happen that you don't notice that you're in camera view and you just move things around and then suddenly you're like, go to zero and you can say, what happened? And why is my camera here? So be careful with that and use passepartout because then it's always obvious that you're in camera view. And with the alpha, you can just change between nothing and completely black, okay? So if you're like, um, having at least uh, a last look at your scene, how everything looks, this might help to see what is actually within um, the camera in view and what isn't. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much what you need to know about the camera settings. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you learned something. Um, thank you for watching and see you next time.